Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome back to our series Health and Fasting. In this episode, we're going to be talking about the types of food that are useful to eat during Ramadan. And we're going to be incorporating what is called the healthy plate or the food pyramid. So, as we know, it's always, we always hear about eating a balanced and healthy lifestyle. This is something that is important for us to do throughout, irrespective of whether we're fasting or not. It's important for us to think about what this means and to try and incorporate this into our day-to-day -day life. So, what does a healthy plate mean? This healthy plate is broken down into four main areas. So, this comprises what we call healthy protein. So, this includes things such as fish, meat, particularly white meat, chicken, but also red meat and thinking about things like uh, avoiding things such as high-fat cheese, salami, so processed meat or meat that is what we call cured. So these are the kind of things to avoid, but having lots of fish, white meat, lean meat, so rather than have a uh, big heavy meat, have something that is lean and has less fat on it. So this is something that is really useful for us to consider and think about how we can incorporate that into our lifestyle. So that is the protein portion of the healthy plate. Thinking about that and how we can incorporate that into our day-to-day -day life, but particularly during the month of fasting. Then we need to think about what we call healthy grains. So these are things such as legumes and grains. So legumes would be things such as beans, lentils and legumes. And also when we think about things such as rice, trying to eat more brown rice rather than white rice. And in terms of flour, if we make bread at home, then using wholemeal flour rather than more white or refined flour. So these are things that will be useful for us to think about incorporating into our day-to-day -day life. The reason for this is that there, when you refine something, whether it's flour or rice, you're removing a lot of the nutrients from it in the process of refining it. So it is then removing what is good for you and then you're left with a less nutritious and less wholesome food. So using white rice or using white bread is less nutritionally good for you than using whole, whole flour or brown rice. So it's useful to think about making these changes in our normal diet, but particularly during fasting. Another thing to think about is increasing and incorporating fruit and vegetables into our diet. Now, we all know about what's called the five a day. So what that means is five portions of fruit or vegetable a day. So a portion of fruit would be something like an apple, an orange, or say at dinner time, a serving of vegetables, uh, broccoli, uh, cabbage, any of these sorts of leafy vegetables or green vegetables are useful to add into the plate and become part of our meal. In terms of fruit, any and all fruit is good for us. Something just to be aware of though is some fruits are higher in sugar, although all of these sugars are what we call good sugars, they're not refined sugars, but just being aware that sometimes some fruits are higher in sugar and people who have diabetes or things like this need to be aware of that and how that may affect their diabetes control. But generally speaking, introducing more fruit and vegetables into our diet, particularly trying to stick with the five a day as a minimum. This is not the maximum, this is the minimum. And people have suggested that trying to move up towards 10 a day is the ideal. Obviously this is very hard to try and incorporate into your diet and lifestyle but starting with five a day is something that will be useful. So if we were not fasting how could we do this? So maybe adding a banana into your breakfast then at mid-morning having a snack such as an apple rather than a biscuit then at lunchtime having an orange and then at dinner time or tea time have a pear 
and then at dinner time you have one portion of vegetables with your meal. <clears throat> so this is just generally health advice in terms of trying to increase the amount of fruit and vegetables that we have as part of our diet. So that's something to really think about in terms of incorporating these elements into our food. Now, in terms of the cooking process, what the person who is in charge of the cooking needs to try and do and be aware of is using oils that are more healthy for you. So for example, olive oil is particularly healthy for you. This is proven through research, but also through anecdotal evidence, what is called the Mediterranean diet. So the southern uh, European countries and the Mediterranean countries where olive oil is used much more uh, frequently than other oils, or particularly in the Asian community, we tend to use too much of hard fats, so butter, uh, something called ghee. These things are really bad for you. They are called solid fats, trans fats. These are not healthy for you, and it's much better to use things like olive oil. So in the Mediterranean diet, there has been evidence both from studies and anecdotally that shows that people who use more olive oil in their cooking tend to have a healthier diet they tend to have less episodes of things like obesity, heart disease and diabetes and will hopefully, inshallah, live longer and healthier lives. So being aware of what we use in terms of the cooking element, in terms of preparing the food, that is also a very useful thing to consider. Okay, so does that mean we can never have treats or anything that we enjoy, such as desserts, sweets, cakes? No, of course not. These are something that we should have, but in moderation. So everyone knows that something in moderation is better for you. And in fact, Islam always says about the middle line using the most sensible and moderate approach. So if this is in keeping with both healthy living and, in, and Islam. So there is no contradiction there in terms of what Islam says and what medical advice says. So that is useful for us to think about that no, it doesn't mean you can never have sweets or never have treats. Of course you can. But these are things that should be taken little and from time to time. But certainly if there's a, if there's a celebration or a, uh, an occasion, for example on Eid, we'll have lots of treats and desserts and, and lovely things to eat. But again, it's only on the odd occasion that we should have these things. And then that brings me to another aspect in terms of fasting. What we find is that during Ramadan, people actually eat more than they do at any other time of the year. I have spoken to many people and uh, from the butchers who supply halal meat, they make their biggest business during Ramadan. This is actually entirely wrong and entirely the opposite of what it should be. We should be being made to be familiar with what it's like for people who are struggling, people who are poor, people who don't have enough to sustain themselves, rather than eating in excess. So unfortunately, it's a very sad situation that in the Muslim community, at least in the UK, we tend to overeat and indulge in, in Ramadan when it should be the exact opposite. So this has been proven to me by speaking to friends and family and in fact, I was speaking to a colleague of mine yesterday who is a non-Muslim doctor and he said to me, when he goes to his Muslim friends in Ramadan, he feels after eating at the iftar time, he can not eat for another two days. That's how much food is available and consumed by us during Ramadan, which is exactly the opposite of what it should be. So this is something that we need to think about, both from a health perspective, but also from a social and charity perspective. We should be thinking about how those who are less fortunate than us, less well off than us, how they are feeling and what it's like for them on a day-to-day -day basis. We should be able to be, have some empathy and compassion with these people. Also, some other tips to think about are thinking how can we help maintain our digestion as effectively as possible. So, we talked about this before in terms of the digestive system, <coughs> but how can we try to prevent side effects from when we eat during Ramadan? So it's good to try not to eat too much at once and space it out. So generally speaking, we would advise eating more at the seri time rather than the iftar time. Now, <clears throat> with the length of the fast in the UK in the summer months, 
this is a difficult thing, but if there is any way we can try and accommodate this, this will hopefully help us to maintain the fast more effectively. The reason for this is that if you eat more at the seri time, hopefully this will sustain you during the day and allow you to continue your normal day-to-day -day activities. Whereas if you eat more at iftar time, then you're going to be going to sleep and then having a full stomach when you're going to sleep. So if there's any way we can eat more at the seri time than the iftar time, this will be helpful, helpful for us and hopefully allow us to carry out the fast more effectively and also continue with our normal day-to-day -day activities. <coughs> so if we eat more at seri rather than iftar, this will hopefully help us continue our fast more effectively. And at the seri time, eating the more complex carbohydrates or what is called low GI food. So GI is what we call the glycemic index. This is a measure of how much sugar that the food has. So eating foods that are of the lower GI variety is more helpful. These are foods that we discussed before about healthy proteins, longer acting, less refined foods that provide energy over a sustained period of time. And the reason for that is if you have energy that is released slowly, you will have less peaks and troughs in your blood sugar and less peaks and troughs in the insulin that is produced by the body. So if you're having peaks and troughs of sugar, what happens is the body produces insulin to try and break this down. The sugar is then broken down and then you start to feel hungry again and need to eat. Whereas if you eat food that is of the low GI variety, then hopefully the sustained level of sugar that is released through a longer period of time will mean that there is no peak and trough in the insulin levels and that means that you'll be less hungry and less having to eat sooner. So it's worthwhile for our viewers to look up and research what, uh, what it means by low GI foods, low glycemic index foods. Have a look on the internet, there'll be lots of resources there for you and you'll be able to get advice about the types of foods that are of the lower GI variety. So we talked about these before briefly, legumes, pulses, lentils. Also a really good source of low GI food is nuts. So a handful of nuts, walnuts, almonds, cashews, these type of things are very useful and it's worth having these in the seri as part of the seri that will hopefully help provide with us uh, a low GI food that will provide sugar over a longer sustained period of time. So hopefully by using these techniques, by employing these simple uh, methods, we'll be able to continue our fasts and continue through the day and be more satisfied and more satiated and hopefully continue with our day-to-day -day requirements whilst also meeting the religious obligations of fasting. I hope that this episode has been useful and helpful for you and I look forward to seeing you again in a future episode when we'll be discussing more issues of health and fasting. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Mm -hmm.